in 2020, a fake study was published on the gluteus maximus, basically looking at squats versus hip thrusts. Now it's this infamous Barbalo study. Uh, Barbalo was a student um, under Paulo Gentile, and it looked at the effects of squats versus hip thrusts, and it was fake. As a practitioner, everyone knew it was fake. You know, people who, trainers and coaches who prescribe squats and hip thrusts, the data did not line up with real world results, but the statisticians took a look at it and hammered it, and since then, four of this group's papers have been retracted, and now people realize that the study never took place. Well, back when that happened, I was talking to my colleague, Menno Hanselmans. We said, we really do need a study on squats and hip thrusts, and ideally it would use MRI, but MRI is expensive. So a few years later, Menno calls me up, hey Brett, let's do this. <laughs> let's get that study conducted. Coincidentally, I'd been talking to Mike Roberts, um, who's a very well-respected scientist, and he's like, hey, I got this student, Daniel Plotkin. Now, Daniel studied under Mike Isretel and Brad Schoenfeld. He's an awesome student. He said, Daniel can get it done. Let's do this. Well, MRIs are expensive, so Menno and I each contributed 40 grand to get this experiment conducted, and we finally posted about it on June 24th. Now, the title of the paper is Hip Thrust and Back Squat Training elicit similar gluteal muscle hypertrophy and transfer similarly to the deadlift. So here's what happened. It's a nine week long study. Now the subjects were all beginners new to strength training. They were aged 20 to 28. We looked at men and women. There ended up being 18 participants in the hip thrust group, five men and 13 women, and 16 participants in the squat group, six men and 10 women. The training regimen was nine weeks long and it was periodized like this. For week one, the subjects did three sets of either squats or hip thrusts twice a week. Week two was four sets per session, so eight total sets for the week. Now weeks three through six, the subjects did five sets per session, and weeks seven through nine, they did six sets per session, so basically 12 weekly sets of either squats or hip thrusts. So they start off with three sets, ended with six sets per session. Obviously progressive overload was utilized. Hip thrusts were with a barbell, you know, standard barbell hip thrusts, Squats were mostly high bar, and the subjects went as deep as possible without screwing up their form. So I think most of the subjects went below parallel. So out of the 16 squat subjects, one of them was super tall and he couldn't get that deep. Interestingly, his glutes grew just fine. His glutes grew very well. Two to three of the subjects were a little bit above parallel, and the remaining 12 or 13 were at least a parallel or well below parallel. Now, this is a really cool paper because we looked at a lot of things. We looked at EMG, you know, electromyography to look at, was it predictive of glute hypertrophy, you know? Hip thrust led to a lot greater glute activity than squats did, but it didn't lead to more growth. So that was the first main finding was that EMG did not predict hypertrophy because squats get a better stretch and muscle produces force actively and passively. So the squat probably has more passive force production, the hip thrust more active force production, leading to a tie in muscle growth. We also looked at hypertrophy using MRI, the gold standard, and we looked at a lot of different muscles and muscle areas. So the first was uh, gluteus maximus, but we looked at the very lower glute max, the mid and the upper, okay? We looked at glute medius and minimus combined. We looked at the adductors, the quadriceps, and the hamstrings. Now I'm gonna put a giant chart up here so you can kind of watch it as I announce the results. For upper glute max, hip thrust led to a 13.7% improvement, squats 12.8%. For the mid glute max, hip thrust 10.7%, squats 10.1%, and then lower glute max, hip thrust 21.5%, squats 19.2%. So very similar gluteus maximus muscle growth. For the glute medius and minimus, hip thrust led to 3.2% change, squats 0.8%. So neither group glue the glute medius that well. For the quadriceps, hip thrust 6.8% improvements, squats 12.6%. So almost double the quadricep growth with squats. Adductors, 4.1% with the hip thrust, 10.3% with squats. So over two and a half times more adductor growth with squats. And finally, hamstrings, 0.8% growth with hip thrust and 1.6% with squats. So interestingly, neither group grew the hamstrings that well either. Now we also looked at strength transfer. Now obviously due to the rule of specificity, squats are gonna build squat strength more than hip thrust. And hip thrusts are gonna build hip thrust strength more than squats. That's like the most basic law of strength training is the law of specificity. But what about deadlifts and horizontal wall pushing? Basically the wall push is how hard you can push horizontally into walls. So this would kind of measure how hard you can push forward. 
which is important in sports and everyday life. So when you take two non-specific exercises, what led to better results? Well, so let's look at the chart. In the three rep max squat, the hip thrust gained 16.7% and the squat group gained 43.1%. So squats way more effective for squat strength. For the hip thrust three rep max, the hip thrust group went up 65.1% and the squat group went up 33.4%. Now here's what's interesting. So with the deadlift three rep max, there was a perfect tie. Both squats and hip thrusts both increased 15.3%. So they led to the exact same deadlift strength gains. And for the wall push, it was a 10% increase for the hip thrust group and a 7.7% increase for the squat group. Put another way, the hip thrust group put 19.1 pounds on their squat, 116.2 pounds on their hip thrust, 20.3 pounds on their deadlift, and 6.7 pounds on their wall push. The squat group put 48.7 pounds on their squat, 59.3 pounds on their uh, hip thrust, 20.3 pounds on their deadlift and 5.1 pounds on their wall push. So let's discuss these results. Most people felt hip thrust working their glutes more, but there was equal growth. And subjects probably felt sore with squats, but it led to equal growth. So where you feel it, so, so sensation doesn't always equal muscle growth. Soreness, feeling the muscle, those don't always predict hypertrophy. EMG didn't predict hypertrophy. I thought that it would, I was wrong. I thought that the lower glute max would have similar gains, but middle and upper glute max gains would be optimized with hip thrust, and that wasn't the case. They led to the same glute growth in all three, the upper, mid, and lower, in all three segments. So you tend to feel hip thrust working more of the upper area, and you tend to feel squats working more of the lower, but that was not reflective with hypertrophy. Now, gluteus medius activation is pretty high with hip thrust, but it didn't lead to much growth. So this indicates that you would want to do frontal plane abduction to maximize glute medius growth. If you're looking to grow the upper glutes, the shelf, you got to throw an abduction. Hamstring EMG is pretty high during hip thrusts, but it didn't grow the hamstrings either. During squats, it makes sense that the hammies wouldn't grow much because you don't get much muscle length change. Plus, you're trying to extend the knees, not flex them. But I did think hip thrusts would grow the hammies and they didn't. And it makes sense that quad growth would be higher with squats. You move through more knee range of motion. And same with adductor growth because you go deeper and the adductors are huge hip extensors at the bottom of a squat. It was interesting with strength gains, I did think that the hip thrust would lead to greater wall push strength because that hip angle is more similar to hip thrust, but that wasn't the case. And with deadlifts, I did predict that. I thought they'd be similar. Now, I suspect that squats lead to better strength gains off the floor for the deadlift and hip thrusts lead to better lockout strength. So squats and hip thrusts are both decent deadlift assistance exercises. Now, we didn't have a combined group. That would have been 40,000 more bucks, but it would have been great because we could have seen our squats and hip thrusts synergistic, meaning is there an additive effect or is it redundant? If you did get better results with the combined group, then that would suggest that hip thrusts lead to muscle growth through more active mechanisms and squats through more passive mechanisms, thereby lending support to what bodybuilders do, which is training muscles at a variety of muscle lengths. Now it could be that the hip thrust shouldn't be thought of as a short position movement because you do go pretty deep in a hip thrust, not as deep as a squat, but maybe you go deep enough in a hip thrust or like I said earlier, maybe hip thrusts generate more active force and squats more passive force. We still need to learn why. I do think this subject design favored the squat. Interestingly, some experts said, well, squats are require more coordination, so you're not gonna get a lot of growth with squats up front because they're gonna be you know, uncoordinated and not well balanced, but I don't think that's the case. I think that doing two days a week favors the squat because, you know, especially beginners, they could hip thrust five days a week. You don't get real sore from hip thrust. You can recover quickly. They don't lead as much fatigue. So you could hip thrust five days a week as a beginner, whereas squats beat you up a little bit more. Two days a week is probably optimal for squatting, but not for hip thrusting. But every study has pros and cons. You know, every study has limitations and it can only be applied to that particular study design. So what this study did show was beginners training their glutes twice a week saw similar results regardless of whether they perform squats or hip thrusts. What would happen with advanced subjects? What would happen with a combined group? What would happen with different volumes and frequencies? We can only speculate. So this paper has been talked about a lot on social media. The squat only and like the powerlifting camps 
They get to say face because they get to say, see, I told you, don't even waste your time with hip thrusts. Just squat and you get big glutes and you also get big quads and big adductors and big legs and you get more squat gains and the same deadlift gains. And the bikini competitors in the hip thrust only camps, they get to say face too. They get to say, see, don't waste your time with squats. Just do hip thrusts. You just grow your glutes. You don't, you know, we don't want big legs. We don't want quads and adductors. We want mostly glutes and it doesn't beat you up as much. It's easier, it's safer. You know, they can also say, hey, in the real world, you know, to get a study published, you have to equate the volume. In the real world, we don't have to equate the volume. We can do way more sets of hip thrusts than we can squats, so clearly hip thrusts are superior. But any logical person would come to the conclusion that you should probably do both, not only for maximizing functional strength, but also for maximizing glute muscle size, glute hypertrophy, and leg hypertrophy too. So just remember, Every study is a puzzle piece and it, it just provides some clues, some evidence, but you know, when you have an entire puzzle put together, each piece is critical, each piece is important, but we need a lot more research. We need way more hip thrust studies, way more glute studies in general to really be sure of how to grow the glutes the best. In the meantime, you should definitely do both squats and hip thrusts if they feel good for you. Most people can find variations of hip thrusts, variations of squats that feel good for their bodies. But let's say squats didn't feel good for you. You could probably find a single leg movement that felt good, like a Bulgarian split squat or a step up or a type of lunge. You might not like barbell hip thrusts, but maybe the glute drive or the Smith machine feels good for you. Nevertheless, I thought you'd like a recap of this study. It'll be the first of a long line of glute research that I intend on funding. In the next video I post, it's gonna be about the whole muscle length debate pertaining to the glutes and what experiments we need to conduct to really get a good idea of how to best train the glutes. Thank you very much for watching. Please make sure you hit like if you like the video. Please make sure you're subscribed to my channel and definitely leave a comment. Let me know what you think about this study. Let me know how you interpret the results. I always like reading what you guys have to say. Thanks again for watching.